Nirvana faced an ethical dilemma of sorts when they decided to leave Sub Pop and move to DGC, a major label. The reason this was considered somewhat of an ethical problem is because for many in the underground music world, particularly in the underground punk scene, the moment a band signs with a major label, they're considered sellouts. Personally, I don't agree with that viewpoint. I think if a band has an opportunity to sign with a major label and make enough money to sustain themselves and their families financially, that's okay. In my opinion, I think the only time a band would really be a sellout for signing with a major label is if they completely abandon their artistic integrity and consistently put out music they don't like just for the sake of making money, especially if that music goes against their values or morals. That is not what Nirvana did, however. Say what you will about the commerciality of Nevermind, but that record is a great record and Nirvana did not abandon their artistic integrity in my view by going with a sleeker production and a major label to get the music out there. However, in the views of some people, they were sellouts for doing that. Dave Grohl once said the following about this, quote, You know, if people want to slag us off and call us sellouts for doing what we're doing before even hearing it, fine. Screw them. Those are the people we don't really care about. Whatever. It's open to anyone's interpretation. If they want to slag us for signing to a major, cool. That's fine. If they don't, great. No big deal. No skin off my back. People are under the impression that we're doing this for all the wrong reasons, and they're just wrong. Kurt wrote a lot of really good songs, and Kurt's got a real good pop sensibility, if you want to call it that. But people think Kurt's writing these pop songs to make a buck, which is stupid. It's completely ridiculous. End quote. To Dave's point, Kurt wrote the majority of these songs over a year before Nirvana began recording Nevermind under DGC. The Nevermind recording session took place in May of 1991, whereas the majority of the songs that appear on Nevermind were first demoed in April of 1990 while the band was with Sub Pop. Later in this video, I'm going to show you a segment from my interview with Sub Pop co-founder Bruce Pavitt where he discusses his exact thoughts on what happened when Nirvana left Sub Pop. But first, I want to go over a few more things. As mentioned, several of the songs that appear on Nevermind were demoed over a year earlier. Originally, the second Nirvana album was going to be released by Sub Pop. The recording session that took place in April of 1990 was not originally meant to be a demo session. It was meant to be the actual session which produced the final recordings that were to appear on Nirvana's second album. What ended up happening, though, was that Nirvana passed around those recordings to various people in the music industry as a way of generating interest from other labels. Nirvana's relationship with Sub Pop was bumpy. One of the reasons being distribution. As a young indie label, Sub Pop understandably didn't have the financial resources the major labels did for promotion and to get albums in stores, etc. In any case, understandably too, Nirvana wanted better distribution, especially considering their popularity was on the rise. Kurt once said the following, quote, Talking to other labels was just something we had to do. There was no reason other than to get our music out just distributed better, like in Kmart. It'd be nice for a 15-year-old in Aberdeen to have the choice, the opportunity to buy our record. That was an opportunity I never had, end quote. The band would eventually sign with DGC, David Geffen Company, in late 1990. Chris Novoselic once said the following about the signing, himself bringing up the point about distribution, quote, We are proud to be label mates with Sonic Youth and Teenage Fan Club. We're totally aware that we're a commodity for DGC. They're there to help us to put our records in the store. We're satisfied because they work for us. Besides, the worst thing they could do is drop us. End quote. Sub Pop was co-founded by Bruce Pavitt and Jonathan Pondman. Looking back on Nirvana's departure from Sub Pop, Jonathan Pondman recalled the following, quote, I think it's inevitable that Nirvana would go on to a larger label, but I don't think it was inevitable that the relationship between Sub Pop and Nirvana, which disintegrated to a large degree, necessarily needed to. I accept my responsibility in that deterioration, but in my own defense, I will say it was driven by the times, my age, unfamiliarity with the circumstances. When you're in your 20s and still feeling your way around and suddenly these media barons and tastemakers are telling you that you're king, it goes to your head. And it went to my head, it went to Bruce's head, it went to Kurt's head and Chris's head, and it would have been nice to have a little bit more trust." End quote. Due to both personal and professional reasons, the relationship between Nirvana and Sub Pop had deteriorated over the years they were together. During the last months of Nirvana's tenure with Sub Pop, the band would often not even respond to Bruce or Jonathan's phone calls. Chris once said the following himself, quote, We wouldn't return their phone calls for weeks and weeks at a time. Every time I talk to Jonathan, I feel that I made it clear that there was definitely an uncertainty in our relationship. 
I just don't understand how you're expected to come right out and tell someone something like that. I suppose it's the more adult thing to do, to tell someone that you don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. It's a really hard thing to do. End quote. The bottom line is that eventually in 1990, Nirvana left Sub Pop for DGC, though there were also many other labels pursuing Nirvana, not just DGC. Chris Novoselic once said that MCA, Capital, Charisma, Columbia, Slash, Polydor, Polygram, and others were in pursuit of them. Ultimately, however, the band felt DGC was the right fit. One of the reasons for this is because of the label's connection with their friend Sonic Youth. Dave Grohl once said the following, quote, The decision to sign with the David Geffen Company was a no-brainer. Following in the footsteps of legendary New York noise hero Sonic Youth, we hired their manager John Silva and trusted that any major label record company brave enough to endorse Sonic Youth's experimental brand of No Wave was definitely a safe place for a band like us. End quote. In Kurt Cobain's words, one of the reasons the band signed with DGC is because they allowed the band space when it came to their creativity. Quote, there were a lot of other labels that we talked to that just had no clue. DGC just really knew the boundaries of our music, and plus, our contract was really well written in terms of artistic freedom and all that stuff. We're in control of what we do, where we tour, exactly what our music sounds like. We have a lot of say-so. Still, I don't think a lot of that matters as long as the band still plays good music. Most of the bands who were on independent labels and then signed to majors ended up writing bad songs, mostly because they had been together for over 10 years. You can't blame that on the label they were on. Then again, I've heard horror stories about bands that have been completely screwed over by major labels. You can lose your A&R guy and end up getting ignored for months, just put on the back burner. It happens all the time. End quote. Now going back to one of the original points in this video, bands are sometimes called sellouts for signing with majors, yet what's often not taken into consideration is that just because a band signs with a major, there's no guarantee the band is going to get rich. Same thing went for Nirvana. When they initially signed with DGC, the band didn't immediately become rich. As a matter of fact, when the band initially signed with the label, they received an advance of $290,000, yet that money quickly faded. Chris Novoselic once recalled the following, quote, 33% of the $290,000 immediately went to taxes. 15% went to our manager. Sub Pop got their chunk through the contract they had. We just set enough aside so we get some money every month. If you worked steady at a fast food joint 40 hours a week, you'd probably get the kind of money we get. In any case, it's nicer being on DGC because we have the freedom to spend a bit more money. We can take our time now and we're guaranteed to get our album in any store. We're not getting any pressure from DGC to change our style in any way. We're wearing exactly the same clothes that we were wearing two years ago. There were all these rumors that we got like a million dollars. In Spin Magazine, it was printed that we got $750,000 and we didn't even get a quarter of that. What we did was, instead of going for the big dough, we went for the strong contract, more freedom and more percentage points on the record. There were a lot of little clauses that are in our favor. We're not in it for the money. We're in it for, you know, the let's put out a record and let's do this thing right kind of attitude. End quote. Ultimately, the band had the opportunity to sign with a major and they took it. Kurt summed it up nicely when he said the following, quote, the opportunity came and I just thought, screw it. End quote. Now, going back to the previous Chris Novoselic quote, where he mentioned that Sub Pop got a chunk of the 290000 the question arises as to why would Sub Pop get paid if the band was no longer on Sub Pop? The answer has to do with Sub Pop's contract with Nirvana. As mentioned earlier, Nirvana was originally going to release their second record under Sub Pop. When Nirvana signed their initial contract with Sub Pop, it was for three albums. Sub Pop had only released one full-length Nirvana record, Bleach. And so when DGC picked up Nirvana, Sub Pop was able to work it so they would get percentages from Nirvana's next two albums through DGC because of the terms of the original Sub Pop contract. What's interesting is that Sub Pop did not actually present the contract on their own initiative to Nirvana. It was Chris Novoselic who demanded Sub Pop give them a contract. Back in 2020, I did an interview with Sub Pop co-founder Bruce Pavitt. And during this interview, Bruce told the story of how Chris essentially forced Sub Pop to give Nirvana a contract. It's kind of a funny story. I'm going to show you that clip now, along with Bruce discussing how Nirvana left the label and how that actually ended up saving the label. Here's the clip. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more. Everything I do on this channel is self-produced. I'm the one arranging all the interviews and videos. Thanks for watching. I have a copy of Nevermind, and on the back of the CD, there's the DGC logo. 
And right beside it, there's the Sub Pop logo, even though Sub Pop wasn't involved in the release of Nevermind. So how come the Sub Pop logo is on Nevermind? And also, what was the, I guess, legal process like getting Nirvana off of Sub Pop and onto DGC? Well, what happened was, uh, I'll give you the story. We sent, we Nirvana signed to a three record deal. And that's a with, good, you guys are with them with us. And that's OK. I'm going to tell you a story here. This is this is some stuff at that time in, in the 80s. Typically, indie labels didn't work with contracts. They didn't have money for attorneys. Right. So it was always a handshake deal. Hey, we'll we'll split the profit. That was just the way indie labels did business. It's a handshake deal. But in 89, the summer of 89, a few months after never, uh, Bleach had been out, Chris Novoselic came to my house and in a fairly aggressive way, insisted that we sign them to an actual contract, okay, which totally saved our ass in the end, right? So yeah. we had no money for an attorney, so I called Poneman. He went to the library. He Xeroxed or photocopied a boilerplate contract, filled in Nirvana, cost us 10 cents, right? They come in, they sign it, and because we had that contract... When Nirvana decided to jump to a major label using the recording of their second album that we thought we were going to release with Butch Vig, again, we, we sent them to Butch Vig in Madison, they recorded the album, they came back, but we, what we didn't know is that they were sending that out as a demo to major labels. This is how it goes. So DGC stepped in and said, we're taking these guys. You're just going to have to deal with it, but we'll negotiate, you know, a settlement. So it was kind of a bittersweet moment. They left the label. We were a little heartbroken, but that's life in the biz. But because they were signed to two more records, we were able to fine tune the negotiation, get that logo on uh, Nevermind, which is definitely a source of pride. We got royalties from In Utero and Nevermind. So that really helped us out tremendously. But it okay. never would have happened if it never would have happened if Chris Nos Novoselic hadn't come to my house and demanded a contract. So life's, an life's funny <laughs> that way. Sub Pop would have gone out of business a lot, 30 years ago, if no Vaselich hadn't asked for that contract. So sometimes these little things can turn your whole life around. And does Chris know about the story? Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> you mentioned now that you got royalties from In Utero as well. What is your connection to In Utero? Well, we, we just had royalties on uh, because we had them signed to a three record contract. They had put out Bleach uh -huh. so that we had to get we got royalties on their next two records. Uh, Incesticide was a co-production between us and DGC, so that was a separate project, so we got royalties from that as well. And Bleach, of course, has sold like 2 million copies by this point. You know, think about this, a $600 recording selling 2 million records. That's pretty unusual. So you mentioned that the recordings Nirvana did with Butch Vig in 1990 were originally meant to be used for the second Nirvana sub-pop record, even though in actuality, Nirvana ended up sending those recordings around trying to get a different deal with a different label. When did you first realize that that was happening? I'll tell you, I was, for some reason, I think I was really pretty oblivious, even though Poneman was like, I hear they're kind of shopping around. And I was literally just still interpreting that as like, no, that wouldn't happen. You know, those are just rumors. And I think he was way more savvy on that than I was. And in fact, that summer, he said go down and visit Kurt and tell him he's got to stick with Sub Pop, you know, convince him to stay with the label. And I did. I went down there and I brought him some some records of uh, outsider artists like uh, Daniel Johnston, Hi, How Are You? I gave him that album. You later see him wearing that that T-shirt everywhere. Well, yeah. that was that was a gift. And it was my way of saying we are always going to support the outsiders. You know, corporations are not going to do that. So we are going to respect your creativity and, and, and support Nirvana. And he also knew we were pretty broke at the time. So it's my understanding he had made up his mind. But still, in my mind, 
I literally couldn't imagine them doing that, even though I went through this whole process <laughs> and went down there and John's like, I think major labels are looking at them. And then he had me go visit them in Las Vegas when they were touring with Sonic Youth. And I go to Las Vegas and in the dressing room, there's a couple of guys from DGC and it's a little strange, but I'm like, oh, the DGC guys are here, you know, and we're chit chatting and, you know, in retrospect, it was just totally obvious what was going on, but I think I just didn't think they would actually do it, that they would stay indie because they were very punk in spirit. And at that time, very few bands did that. So it was, it was almost inconceivable to me that they would actually do that. And that's obviously what was going on the whole time. So when did you first realize that Nirvana was in fact going to leave the label? Well, I will tell you they did they did a show in September at this garage it's kind of an infamous infamous show I'm trying to remember the name of this garage this uh, motorsports motorsports garage thank you the motorsports motorsports show uh, was kind of their last indie sub pop related show and unbeknownst to Danny Peters who was drumming with them they had already decided that they were going to bring in Dave Grohl I didn't know anything about the girl situation. We, Sub Pop had just put out a single Sliver and Dive by Nirvana. And Nirvana just kept telling us, hey, we need some time before we put out the album. So here's a single. So that's what they're telling me, right? And I'm just taking that at face value. So it was right after that show, somebody basically said, you know, we're seeing Nirvana riding around in limos. You, you know that, right? You know, everybody's courting them. And I'm like, and I'm still like, no, it's not happening, not happening. It was just like this weird psychological thing. And finally somebody yeah. said, dude, they signed to DGC. And I I think I kind of snapped. I remember being just profoundly, profoundly sad, like that it, it sunk in that, yes, this is happening. It's kind of like you hear you, maybe your your girlfriend's cheating on you and you're like, no, that wouldn't happen. And the next thing you know, you don't have a girlfriend anymore. It's a little bit like that, you know, and the mind does funny things when it doesn't want to deal with reality. But then, I mean, obviously it has that Cinderella ending when, when they blew up and it kind of, you know, yeah. saved the label. It, yeah, right? it, it does. So it really worked for everybody in a way. But see, there's just so many layers to the story. And this is where I'm going to get a little sad here is that they blew up. And from a business point of view and a cultural point of view is tremendous. But then you have layers and layers of this pressure with Kurt and he's no longer with us, you know? So there's so many different ways of looking at the story, but ultimately it's safe to say that they had a tremendous cultural impact and really changed a lot of lives for the better. And I think we can all be really glad about that. So in general, what was that experience like for you where Nirvana is no longer on your label, but you're still getting the financial benefits of them taking off all of a sudden and just seeing your friends become famous? It was it was exciting to watch that happen. I really didn't see Kurt a whole lot after that, but I did see him at some key moments, me personally. So, you know, there's money coming into the label. We're signing new acts, like literally millions of dollars are pouring in. Whereas, like I said, we had less than a hundred bucks in August of 91. That all changed within six months. We're rehiring, we're re-signing. Uh, Bleach is going through the roof. We sell a million copies of Bleach. Again, millions of dollars have come in. So that was that was all exciting. And then for us, the mania that happened in Seattle, you'd have camera crews coming in from Spain. And of course, we had an office, so they could always get an interview with us. And I remember doing like an interview a day for at least a year because the Seattle grunge thing was blowing up. So it was ridiculous. It was exciting. It was a little weird. Uh, but ultimately, it was uh, an amazing, amazing time. Uh, I will say that the last time I really had a good conversation with Kurt was at a key point in their career was at, after their set that they played Saturday Night Live. They played Saturday Night Live like the second Saturday in January. Their record had just knocked Michael Jackson off the number one spot. It was kind of the peak of the explosion. They play Saturday Night Live. So they're selling 400,000 records a week. And I went backstage after the show and I got to hang out with Kurt. And it was just him and me talking. 
and he was really glad to see me and you could tell that he was just in a in an ecstatic state that they were achieving so much success and he told me how much he wanted to open a petting zoo for children and you know he had all these fantasies and stuff he was going to do with his cash and and you know he goes kids are asking me for my autograph and and even though supposedly Nirvana didn't do autographs that was kind of a thing you would hear he specifically told me that he was that he was honored he was he was enjoying being a rock star he was straight up was like kids are asking me for autographs it's cool it was good he was he was in a really good place if i may ask do you have any regrets from your time with nirvana or are you content with how things played out you know i i tend to be a no regrets kind of kind of person i'm just really honored that i was able to have the relationship that we did and that's the funny thing about history. You can go, well, wouldn't it have been better if this happened or that happened? But, you know, it all kind of unfolded in this mind-blowing way. So I would, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't touch a thing because, you know, it just, it, it, it was what it was. So no regrets. I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change a thing. If I was writing the movie script, I'd be like, no, keep the script that way. <laughs> You're really set on getting this movie done. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the script writer who did Straight Outta Compton has already put together a script and he's shopping it around, so it really? it actually could could happen. Really? About Sub Pop or Nirvana? It's actually about Sub Pop, but there's definitely some Nirvana scene. In fact, the first scene in the script is, is Kurt on top of the PA stack in, in Rome. Do you have a favorite Nirvana song? A song that I really like a lot that's that's underrated and it's more on a, a, on an obscure list. If I had to pick a song that I think is is underrated, it would have to be the original version of Ben a Son. After they did Bleach, we put them back in a studio with the producer Steve Fisk and they recorded two songs, Stain and Ben a Son. And then we released a 12-inch EP, right? I finally got my EP out there with Love Buzz and Big Cheese on the other side. And that came out in England. So when they toured the UK in 89, this is when Kirk kind of had his breakdown and we did the Lame Fest showcase and they totally blew everybody away. We had that EP out and on that EP has this song called Been a Son. There's a couple different versions out, but the original one I think sounds great. And it's one of my favorite songs and I, I just recommend people check it out. Was there ever any point in time in Sub Pop's history where you felt like, you know what, things just aren't working out, let's pack it in? Did you ever get to that kind of a point? Yeah, and the funny thing about that is the I was just going through the timeline the other day, and I would say late August of 91, John and I were about the only ones left in the office. We had laid off the staff, and we went to a convention that my friend Calvin put together in Olympia called the International Pop Underground Convention. Fugazi was there, L7 was there, all sorts of bands were there. We went down there, and a photographer came up to me and said, that check you gave me last week for $100, that bounced. And I, I'm a little upset about that. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. So I went to my bank account and drained my personal account and gave him my last $100 because our company didn't even have $100, okay? And you got to realize this is late August. So a few days after that, what happens? DGC, DGC is shipping Smells Like Teen Spirit to radio. A week later, it starts blowing up. A month later, the record's selling. Four months later, we do the math and we're, we're due at least a half a million dollars from, uh, from Geffen. A month later, we're like, oh, we're actually due a million dollars from Geffen. So this, just at that moment, we're like, we literally cannot come up with a hundred dollars. This is the scene in the movie where we're supposed to just pack it in. And we almost did. But it turned around miraculously. So I think that's, that's an epic timeline. That's amazing. So how did it feel, you know, knowing that the company was about to go into the ground and then all of a sudden Teen Spirit blows up and basically saves the company? That felt incredible. As soon as it came out, I was getting phone calls from all over the country. A friend of mine in Chicago was saying, you know, I just heard that song blasting out of a taxi cab that just drove past my window. There was a nightclub in Seattle called The Vogue, which was a dance club. 
And the DJ called me up and he said, you know what? I never play rock, but last night I thought I'm going to try Smells Like Teen Spirit. And it was the hit of the night. So I'm like, it's just, it's getting played in taxi cabs. It's getting played in dance clubs. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, it's on MTV and it was beyond, you know, beyond, beyond. It was, it was an incredible rush. And then when you saw them go into regular rotation on MTV, game over, you know. When you first heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, did you think it was something special? Absolutely. Although I had some some criticisms of their earlier work, I remember John and I, we were down at this Seattle nightclub and a representative from DGC, this is probably uh, August of 91, said she had a tape of the of the album and we went outside and we went in her car, we threw it on, we heard it from front to back. And every second of that record was blowing our minds. We instinctively knew that it was going to be huge. And especially Smells Like Teen Spirit. As soon as we heard it, we're like, speechless. Knew yeah. it was just, knew it was going to not, it would, they were knocking it out of the park. And to see that confirmation was, uh, that was so exciting that I, I just knew that there was never going to be another moment in my life in the music business that was going to rival that. Really? Absolutely. And I remember I, I, you know, I exited the biz a couple decades ago to raise some kids and kind of do something else. But I know I knew that, like, there's no way that I'm ever going to experience that level of excitement again. I did it. You know, I can I can I can park that. Really? What specifically made you feel that strongly about that? Well, just, you know, to put things in perspective, I had been. Uh, an, an indie music activist for a decade at that point. The whole point of the uh, the sub pop zine and radio show, et cetera, et cetera, was to promote these regional bands that would typically press like a thousand singles. If they sold 5,000 albums, that was a really big deal. 15,000 was knocking it out of the park. So that was that was the culture during the 80s. Things started to ramp up a little. Sales were getting a little better. But I had seen years and years of small regional bands barely eking out a living. And to see Nirvana, who had gone from a thousand copies of their, you know, Love Buzz single to selling 400,000 records a week by January of 92 was such an extreme turnaround that it was literally mind-blowing. 